In my last video, we covered Sega's most famous 8-bit console, the Master System, and along with it, Sega's early years. So, for their epic 16-bit console, we're going to dive right in at 1983, the point I believe the Mega Drive really began to fall. As we know, Sega had been in the arcade business for some years by now, but in North America, the industry was looking a little shaky to say the least. However, keen to stay ahead of the technological curve, Sega Enterprises over in Japan had just released the Sega System 1. This was an adaptable hardware board used to power various arcade cabinets between 1983 and 1987, including Choplifter, Flicky, Pitfall 2 and Wonder Boy in Monsterland. In 1985, the board was updated to the Sega System 2, allowing more flexibility than its predecessor. Both of these boards were based on the 8-bit Zilog Z80, the same CPU used to power their Sega Master System, although the arcade boards had one dedicated to graphics, one to sound, and various custom chips, including the Sega 315-5011 GPU, sprite generators, and tile map chips. The hardware allowed Sega to release some pretty significant machines, but back in the 80s, the arcades were the source of cutting-edge technology, and it didn't take long for home equipment to start catching up. Sega's cutting-edge solution was the Sega System 16 board, released in late 1985, making use of a Motorola 68000 CPU along with an Intel i8751 microcontroller, an NEC Z80 clone for sound, working alongside a Yamaha YM2151 sound chip. This new hardware powered experiences such as Shinobi, Golden Axe, Altered Beast and Dynamite Ducks. Although Sega had sold North American arcade distribution rights to Bally in 1983, arcade machine manufacturer was still their backbone, with Japan leading the surge in technology. But as we know, Sega weren't blind to the home industry, currently witnessing a resurgence with Nintendo's entertainment system. In 1987, they managed to find some footing in Europe for their first Western console, the Sega Master System. Early sales looked good in the region, if a little sparse in the rest of the world, but it was enough to solidify Sega's belief that home hardware was the future. Sega had sunk their claws into Europe and Australia, but even with their superior 8-bit hardware, they were too late to rival Nintendo on their home shores of Japan and North America. The obvious strategy was to head onwards and upwards. They needed to go all out and this time be the first to grace the world with a revolutionary console that would blow the entertainment system clean out of the water. Nintendo could keep their 8 little bits. Sega were about to double it. Sega weren't a company to pause, having launched the SG-1000, SG-1002, Mark III and Master System in quick succession, work had already begun on the next generation of console, instigated by Hayao Nakayama and led by Masami Ishikawa, with Hideki Sato as the main designer. In October 1987, NEC in collaboration with Hudson Soft released the PC engine to great fanfare. At the same time, Sega's repackaged Master System was failing on their own shores. The PC Engine's technical ability over even the Master System was impressive, and although the PC Engine's Hudson Soft HUC6280 CPU was technically an 8-bit processor, it had a 16-bit graphics processor and many advanced features, allowing some impressive arcade conversions. This further solidified Sega's motives to go big, and they turned to the most obvious place their System 16 arcade hardware. This was the genesis of the Mega Drive. The new system's board would be built around the Motorola 68000 CPU clocked at 7.6 MHz. Like the Sega 16 board, it was decided a Zilog Z80 should take control of the sound provided by the 6-channel Yamaha YM2612 FM synthesizer and 4-channel Texas SN76489 PSG chip. This combination also allowed backwards compatibility with Master System titles, although sadly not the Japanese Master System's FM sound capabilities. 72KB of RAM was provided alongside 64KB of video RAM. The YM2612 based video processor is an evolution of the Sega Master System VDP. It allowed a palette of 512 9-bit RGB colours, allowing a standard 64 on screen. This could be tripled through shadow and highlight use, and even further with clever direct memory palette swaps. 
The hardware can accommodate a maximum of 320 by 480 interlaced pixels in PAL mode with a total overscan of 43 by 624. Multiple multi-direction scrolling routines were made available, semi-transparency and a total of 80 on-screen sprites. Very early models had a 9-pin DIN AV out, but this was quickly replaced by a mono 8-pin DIN, allowing stereo sound via the front audio jack. Like the Master System, an edge connector was provided, allowing bus expansion, and the whole system can be fed from the same power supply as their 8-bit line. As for the control pads, well, they're 3 plus 1 buttons of absolute glory. Look at those curves, it makes me weak at the knees just looking at them. And the case design, well, oh yeah, it's like one of Batman's gadgets, and we're talking Michael Keaton Batman, not one of the crap ones. I'm Batman. The design allowed for some impressive System 16 abilities in a much more affordable package. Initially named the Mark V, the initial prototypes were ready in early 1988 and first appeared in the June 1988 edition of Beep magazine. However, the Mark V moniker just lacked the grunt to convey the new, impressive abilities of this 16-bit beast, and Sega finally settled on Mega Drive to try and best the already grand-sounding Master System. Launching on the 29th of October 1988 in Japan, the date could hardly have been worse. Nintendo had launched Super Mario Bros. 3 just one week prior, and most front covers were awash with the bloody plumber rather than Sega's new system. However, the coverage the console received was positive nonetheless. The only problem was its rivals. The Famicom was still immensely popular, but NEC's new machine was now outselling it and would soon take a third of the total video game market. This was assisted by some rather impressive arcade conversions, and ever keen to cash in, this actually included some licensed Sega titles. Still, Sega's plans of releasing arcade follow-ups on the new home platform seemed a solid one, allowing a natural flow from the arcade into the home with titles such as Space Area 2 and Super Thunder Blade available from the go. alongside Altered Beast and Nonsense Theatre. Compared to the Famicom and PC Engine, however, choice was somewhat lacking. Despite its impressive capabilities, the Mega Drive would sell a moderate 400,000 units in its first year on home territory. Various bizarre and somewhat niche peripherals were also introduced to push revenues, including the Sega Mega Answer. A complete online banking package created for Nagoya Bank, and the hardware was even adapted back to an arcade format, released as the Sega Seaboard. But thankfully this was never really about Japan. A bigger market was waiting, and if Sega moved quickly they could get ahead of the curve. Sega! As 1989 came around, NEC was set to launch their PC engine in North America as the remodeled TurboGrafx-16 drawing attention to its semi-16-bit architecture. This pushed Sega to announce an initial release date of January the 9th, 1989, merely months after the Japanese launch. Originally, Sega tried to convince Atari to license their machine. With the Master System still in the hands of distributor Tonka Toys, Sega didn't really have an appropriate networking facility in America. David Rosen, who was then Vice President of Sega Enterprises, visited Atari's video game president Michael Katz, who was interested in the deal, but negotiations broke down over money, with Jack Trammell more interested in pushing the Atari ST. However, this negotiation was not fruitless, as it brought about a brainstorm of names for the US machine, required due to the Mega Drive name already being used by Mega Drive Systems Inc., a producer of digital storage devices. The name chosen would be one of Atari's suggestions, the Genesis, deemed appropriate given the somewhat Christian nature of the population and connotations to starting something new. 
Sega would launch the console via its reduced Sega of America subsidiary for $189, with a revised and limited launch occurring on the 14th of August 1989 in New York and Los Angeles. Sega of America's staff numbers were quickly ramped up from the small team of 50, and Michael Katz was poached from Atari to come on board as president of Sega America. The TurboGrafx-16 would launch around the same time on the 29th of August 1989, and things were going to be close. In fact, Nintendo's president Hiroshi Yamauchi dismissed Sega being only a mere $700 million company and was far more concerned with NEC's offering, who were investing a hefty amount into marketing and had a whopping $3.7 billion R&D budget, more than Nintendo's annual sales. However, neither of them fully accounted for Sega's arcade experience, which was present from the go. Sega had learnt from their Master System years about game bundling, and included Altered Beast as the pack-in game, a worthy conversion of their new coin-op. Nintendo's 8-bit console was still selling well, especially with Mario 3 on the loose, but an ever-increasing thirst for an extended arcade quality experience in the home was becoming ever more present. Machines like the Amiga and Atari ST models could come close, but at a pretty high outlay for the consumer. At $189, the Genesis was affordable at only twice the price of the NES, and it had true 16-bit power. The only problem was Sega needed some killer titles to convince the public to upgrade. Sega of Japan had made the pretty unpopular call to integrate region lockout to circumnavigate differing release dates and prevent game importing. However, alongside Altered Beast, a number of reasonable titles and arcade conversions were made available throughout 1989, with the console itself in full distribution before the year was out. But Nintendo still had quite a tight grip on the market, and their restrictive licensing deals were preventing some third-party publishers from joining the 16-bit show, causing continued issues for both Sega and NEC. However, like Nintendo, Sega had adopted the licensed marketing model, meaning developers had to pay a royalty to publish on their machine. Some might describe this as ensuring only quality software houses published. Others might call it just shameless money-making which actually limited the amount of software for machines. Thankfully for Sega, Trip Hawkins, founder of EA, had raised his head when the Mega Drive landed in Japan and imported one to EA's labs. Their plan was to reverse engineer the hardware and work out a way of circumventing Sega's licensing costs. Electronic Arts had already refused to publish for the NES due to Nintendo's strict exclusivity and licensing contracts, but with Sega, there was an opportunity. After almost nailing the hardware, Hawkins approached Sega for partnership, arguing that they'd publish without their consent otherwise. Given that Sega needed software and had already started down the route of seeking celebrity endorsement to oust Nintendo's exclusive rights, EA Games, with their previous experience under the hat, seemed the perfect match. A $2 million licensing fee cap was arranged, and EA got to work bringing games like Populous, Battle Squadron, and Budokan, the Marshall Spirit, to the table by early 1990, with sports titles like John Madden Football following later in the year. Rather than requiring Sega to build the cartridges, the deal also allowed EA to control their manufacturing process allowing for the little yellow identification tab we became familiar with on their games. It would later transpire from EA creative director Bing Gordon that EA hadn't quite managed to circumnavigate all Sega's lockouts by that point, but they took the risk anyway. From this point, companies who were bound to Nintendo started jumping ship, forcing Nintendo to rip up its exclusive licensing requirements by mid-1990 and this gave developers and publishers a more liberal roam on the consoles of their choosing. The Genesis software collection was starting to look substantial, and even NEC's Turbo Graphics, with its existing Japanese software line was trailing behind, not helped by the rather obscure omission of a second controller port out of the box. 
Combined with the Genesis sound and graphics, the remaining console scene was starting to resemble children's toys, and the 16-bit console would rack up almost 500,000 sales in just over six months. That the game systems really are optimized. We've built the graphic chips to really work well with games. The 16-bit give you more detail, faster motion, better music, all, all of, of the them. above. Yeah. And first of all, you have real digitized voices. Michael's here is trying to save these kids who've been kidnapped. Now watch this. There he is, and he's just, you know, waiting for it. One of his old moves from the cartoon. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Now, he's pretty close to the edge there. Let's see, you know, he might have a little problem. Uh-oh! <laughs> oh, look at the emotions on his face. Yes. You know, that's what's really making the difference between this generation of video game system and the, you know, generation... Yeah, and, and the relative depth of that background, too. But Sega wanted something big. Nakayama had set the goal of one million units before the year was out. Michael Katz had held the reins well, even with the Genesis does what Nintendo don't advertising. Michael Jackson's Moonwalker video game, only on the Genesis system by Sega. Which proved somewhat controversial to the company's Japanese board, where aggressive marketing was not in the culture. But still, Sega of Japan wanted something fresh and invigorating to hammer a pin into America and make sure it didn't come loose. This mid-1990 invigoration would come in the form of Tom Kalinske, fresh out of Mattel. Tom realised there was still a large hill to climb against Nintendo's entertainment system, and had observed that software support was an essential part of it. After settling in, one of the first moves was to lower the price to $149. The console was also revised around this time, one of many cost-cutting occasions where Sega revised the hardware, including the removal of the rear serial port used in Japan for modem devices, which could make use of MegaNet, an online multiplayer service offering downloadable titles. Various PCB iterations were also rolled out. You may notice that the first Genesis and Mega Drive models have high definition graphics around the edge. Later models removed this and some of these suffer from sound degradation. Original models also don't show the under license from Sega Enterprises Limited boot message. This was added in to try and stamp out unlicensed games by the likes of Accolade by forcing cartridges to display the Sega name and thereby allowing a copyright infringement case if it appeared about Sega's authority. However, a subsequent case against Accolade was lost, leading to Sega taking them on as an official licensee. Anyway, I've gone off track slightly, back to Kalinsky. As well as reducing the system price, he also removed the Altered Beast pack-in, which didn't really fit with the godly Genesis image, and opted for a certain other character. Nintendo dominates over here. One in every three American homes has at least one piece of Nintendo hardware. So, in most game shops, the Sega display tends to be much smaller, quieter, and strangely hedgehog. -y. Sega had learned about company mascots for Hardway, with Mario bolstering NES sales since 1985. And although Alex Kidd had helped the Master System's cause, Sega of Japan felt the need for something new and fresh that would epitomize the speed of their new hardware. A company-wide contest was launched which included a design by Naoto Oshima called Mr. Needlemouse, sporting red sneakers and accompanied by an anime-inspired egg. A tech demonstration was created by Yuji Naka showing a fast-moving ball careering through a winding tube, and when combined with Mr. Needlemouse, Sonic, the astonishingly fast hedgehog, was born. His colouring was changed to match the Sega logo, and his shoes were matched to something Michael Jackson had worn around his waist. After witnessing this little guy, Tom knew he was a winner, despite reservations from Sega of America's executives, who apparently seemed puzzled as to what a hedgehog even was. Kalinsky pushed Nakayama to have Sonic as a pack-in title, upsetting the Japanese board who felt their most impressive title should be making money rather than giving away for free but Tom was given free reign to do as he pleased. Sonic was launched on June 23rd, 1991 as both a pack-in game and a standalone cartridge. A US-based team was also established to create titles specifically for the American market, 
and the aggressive marketing campaigns were allowed to continue, and if anything, even notched up a gear. What the heck was that? Uh, forgot what I was gonna say. Welcome to the next level. This was a good thing, because whilst this was going on, two things happened. The first was that the Sega Mega Drive would launch globally in 1990, landing in areas where the Master System had fared well, such as Australia, distributed by Odysoft, Brazil, in the hands of Tectoy, and in the key area of Europe on the 30th of November 1990, distributed by Virgin Mastertronic, who successfully trumped the NES with their Master System marketing. Thankfully, Master System owners could still access their diverse library vis-a-vis -vis the Master System Converter, allowing cartridges to plug through and access the compatible hardware. These region launches brought a wave of existing software titles with them, providing a strong platform for a swathe of already loyal Sega customers looking to upgrade, along with 8-bit home computer owners who were starting to find their hardware a little long in the tooth. £199, pounds. Sinclair Plus 2 £139. Pounds both with free joystick and six free games. Perhaps though, more importantly than this, the Super Famicom had launched, albeit only in Japan at this point, on the 21st of November 1990, poised to compete not only with the Mega Drive and PC Engine, but also their existing 8-bit Famicom console. However, unlike the Mega Drive, loyal Famicom owners were overwhelmingly keen to get hold of the new hardware with the next instalment of Mario and its initial shipment of 300,000 units sold within hours, leading the Japanese government to ask video game manufacturers to schedule future console releases at weekends to avoid disruption. As you can imagine, this sent shockwaves through the bones of Sega, who couldn't rival Nintendo despite their two-year head start. But back in Europe and the States, things were still looking rosy. News of the Super Famicom had travelled fast, but not as fast as Sonic was powering across screens, even in 50 Hz European regions. From Sega, the Mega Drive, with Sonic the Hedgehog game. People were not only amazed at the graphical and musical finesse of Sonic, they were enamoured by the character himself. Price, Slotting right in with Sega's continued advertising, pitching their machine as cool. Even paying for late night advertising aimed at adults, compared to Nintendo's almost childlike appeal. <laughs> this tactic, along with the bundling of Sonic as the pack in game, proved perfect. So perfect, in fact, that by the time the somewhat boxy, remodelled Super Nintendo hit the States on August the 23rd, 1991, for a reasonable $199, kids were slightly deterred by the Nintendo name. A Sony focus group found that teenage boys would not admit to owning a Super NES over a Genesis, and the Genesis continued to outsell the Super NES at a ratio of 2 to 1. Amazing titles like F-Zero and of course Super Mario helped push the Super NES forward, but Sega held the definite advantage. Christmas 1991 would see Sega outsell Nintendo for the first of four Christmas seasons in a row, holding a much larger library of games than the SNES and infinitely cooler than the NES. Sega would buy out Virgin Mastertronic this year, forming Sega's European presence for the first time. The Super Nintendo, back in its Japanese box, would follow in Europe during April 1992, and was met with a similar, if more, lukewarm reception than in the States. Over here, the Mega Drive didn't even have the NES's competition, with its main rival being the Atari ST and Amiga, but the lower cost ensured that it quickly dominated as the 16-bit home machine of choice. Portuguese cultural attaché waiting in the drawing room. Oh, oh no! Oh, no! Oh. Stowing, intrepid intergalactic Nintendo. However, this would also be the year that the Super NES began to fight back. Arcade classics like Final Fight were released, although it was somewhat cut down and not before Sega had already launched the arguably better Streets of Rage. 
The first real blow would be the release of Street Fighter 2 in August 1992, a clear year before the Genesis would see its own incarnation. <laughs> Special combat speed. The amazing Mario Kart was also launched just a month later, causing Sega's bashing machine to go into full operation. Track into a giant mud pit. The Sega Genesis has blast processing. Super Nintendo doesn't. So what's blast processing do? What if you don't have blast processing? <laughs> Blast processing was the ingenious result of Sega's technical director, Marty Franz, discovering that you could pull some nifty tricks with scanline interrupt timings. Senior producer Scott Bayliss then mentioned to the PR team that you could just blast data into the DACs, a reference to how the direct memory controller could push data into the graphics processor at high speed, allowing for some impressive visuals including 256 color static images. The Mega Drive's Motorola 68000 CPU also had a much faster clock speed than the Super Nintendo's WDC 65816 processor at 7.6 MHz to 3.58 MHz. Chosen to offer backwards compatibility with NES titles, but unable to be successfully implemented. This is why the SNES was bolstered with an additional MAPS coprocessor, but it still meant Sega had something to wedge their pickaxe into. And they did. Hard. You might think this is all marketing spiel, and indeed it mostly is, but even Trip Hawkins of EA acknowledges that the Mega Drive was just faster at animating conventional games. Of course, the Super Nintendo had various custom chips under the hood and in cartridges offering impressive scaling and scrolling techniques like Mode 7, used somewhat ironically in the very game they were panning, but Sega weren't going to point that out. With 1992 drawing to a close and blast processing soon to be firmly cemented into playground banter, Sega could claim to hold an impressive 55% of the active video game market, and for every Nintendo game in total, 1.4 Genesis titles were alone being sold. After all the hype, Sonic 2 is being released worldwide next Tuesday, or Sonic Tuesday. Sonic 2 was released on Tuesday, November the 21st, dubbed as Sonic Tuesday, and in Super Mario 3 style received even more impressive reviews than its predecessor. Revenues stood at some $700 million, but yet Sega's marketing budget was only $20 million, a fifth of Nintendo's. Nintendo even started exaggerating their console sales at this point to appear they were performing better, which makes comparisons harder but suggests the North American Super Nintendo install base was some 4 million at this point, compared to about double that for the Sega Genesis. There's a family fun and pets love it too. But Nintendo was a fighter and now had a huge dominance over the home Japanese market, outselling the PC engine, with the Western Turbo Graphics almost resigned to a footnote. Sega and Nintendo were locked into a furious battle. Whatever one company did, the other would try and do better. The Nintendo Super Scope was swiftly followed by the multi-part and menacer, and although both lacked a compelling selection of games, it was another peripheral for gamers to drool over and argue about in playgrounds. Endless the evil Skynet. Sega were again eager to get one up on Nintendo, fearing their dominance may not last for long. But rather than a new console, that fear would be realised in the form of the Sega Mega CD. Released in Japan in December 1991 and now hitting US shores during October 1992 as the Sega CD. When it arrived, it was a pretty exciting piece of hardware, showcasing some impressive games which looked like actual movies. But this is a case where reality often fell short of expectation. Although the Sega CD was a masterclass in expansion technology, it was still severely limited by the Genesis 16-bit bus and limited color palette. Data just couldn't be shuffled around fast enough leading to games a little lacking in the playability factor, and many titles were just Genesis titles with CD soundtracks. However, there were some standout games, such as Sonic CD and Final Fight CD. A vast improvement over the Super Nintendo port. 
The main problem was the expensive price tag which many gamers just couldn't afford or even justify for the games available. Technology was starting to get cheaper and rather than spending more, many budget gamers were starting to enter the 16-bit market. To help with this, clones, both the official and unofficial variety, began to appear. More Mega Drive news, except it's not a Mega Drive, it's a Scorpion. It's the first non-Sega Sonic compatible console. Made by a British company, it comes complete with two of these six-button turbo joypads. It looks like a Mega Drive and it plays like a Mega Drive, but it does have some extra features as well. I'll just switch it off and turn it over to show you. Now, on the back, there's a hidden panel, and the idea is when you buy a Scorpion, you'll get a free game built in. What will happen is the shop owner will... Along with these bootlegs, systems like the JBC Wonder Mega appeared, incorporating the Mega CD with the Mega Drive in one sleek package. So now let's see what you can do when you apply yourself. One mind, one machine, XI, multi entertainment there were even IBM PC compatibles incorporating Mega Drive functionality, such as Amstrad's Mega PC released in 1993 and modelled on the Japanese Terra Drive released in 1991. <laughs> These machines attracted a niche audience, but with their PC hardware already somewhat out of date and the hefty price tags, didn't make huge progress. Still, by god, I wanted one bad. Sonic the Hedgehog himself actually had a better brand recognition than even Mickey Mouse at this point, and Sega even had plans to be bigger than Disney, with plans for networked theme parks in Japan and America. But the Mega CD may have been the point the high watermark was reached and began to show signs of receding very slightly. By 1993, Sega America had 700 staff, with $3.6 billion in gross salaries. Compared to just 35 staff and gross salaries of $813 million in 1989, Sega had come a long way, but also had a longer distance to fall. Still, the 16-bit industry wasn't slowing down much, even in the face of new machines such as the Atari Jaguar or Amiga CD32. Let's review the numbers. Sega Genesis is 16 bits. 3DO is 32 bits. The Atari Jaguar is 64 bits. Which is more advanced? Clifford! Thanks in part to a dwindling cost of the Model 2 hardware. Released as the Mega Drive 2 in Japan and Europe, and just poised as another Genesis in North America, the Mega Drive 2 was sold at a discounted rate, thanks to some corner cutting in its design. Alongside the revised detail colouring, red in Europe, black in America and blue and grey in Japan, the system lost the front audio out, rear RGB connector in favour of a smaller 9-pin AB port, although allowing stereo sound, and condensed internals, which affected the audio mixing quality even further than previous hardware revisions. Thankfully, Europeans would still be able to play their Master System games thanks to the Master System Converter 2. 1993 was also the year the Mega CD made it to Europe, but due to some strange timing, also the year the new flatter, cheaper Mega CD 2 arrived, leading to a strange situation where the Mega CD hardware was price reduced quite rapidly within a few months, denting consumer confidence somewhat. The UK especially was the region where the Amiga CD32 was selling reasonably well, and offering direct competition to the Mega CD's market slowed Sega's penetration even further. Incredible graphics. And colours. So many colours. The Mega Drive had sold some 30 million consoles worldwide at this point, and Christmas 1993 would mark the point I obtained my own piece of 16-bit wonder. But the SNES, as we sometimes like to call it, was still gaining traction. Given that Sega already dominated across most of Europe, our region hadn't seen the aggressive Sega marketing against Nintendo, and so the Super NES with its vast colour palette was turning heads at an ever-increasing rate. In fact, we hadn't even heard of blast processing over here at all. Our playgrounds were awash with kids holding up specification sheets and chanting out clock frequencies rather than canned marketing slogans. 
The arrival of Street Fighter 2 Championship Edition for the Mega Drive brought a new round of playground arguments and disputes, and although the SNES version looked and played better, the Mega Drive was still very clearly holding its own. Even the issue of only having four buttons compared to eight on the Super Nintendo was addressed with the arrival of six button pads flooding into shops. But Sega was still thoroughly leading the charge of cool gaming for an older generation. Games like Night Trap on the Mega CD and Mortal Kombat, which retained the arcade's gore via a well-distributed code, caused uproar among governments, and Sega themselves would instigate the Video Game Rating Council for all of its systems, including MA17 rated adult games. Over in the UK, Night Trap was given 15 film classification due to the use of real actors. <laughs> Nintendo, on the other hand, towed the family-friendly line of replacing the blood in Mortal Kombat with sweat and removing fatalities for more relaxed finishing moves. Scorpion win. Nintendo's family-friendly line certainly sold some consoles, but Sega were exposing a whole new market of the older generation who hadn't even considered gaming before this point. With this new market neatly carved out, the new generation of consoles were on the horizon. Sony had already attempted to work with Nintendo on a Super NES CD hybrid, but after falling on its face had also approached Sega. Given their knowledge obtained from the Mega CD, they felt a partnership could be fruitful. However, Sega executives declined and Sony would continue alone. Sega of Japan were working on their own next generation hardware, but Sega of America felt something was needed to fill the gap. Rather than having faith in their existing hardware, the 32X was unveiled at June 1994's Consumer Electronics Show and was really a product of fear. ...into your Mega Drive, and then you connect the video output of the Mega Drive with the 32X, like so, then you slot in the card. It combines the graphics of the Mega Drive with the 32X, as well as Star Wars Arcade, so we'll be releasing two other games for it before Christmas. Doom is a conversion of the classic PC game, and this one, Virtual Racing Deluxe, features more tracks and two brand new cars. Fear of Nintendo, fear of Atari's Jaguar, and even the CD32. Keen not to lose their hardware dominance, Sega had decided that graphical advancement was key, despite the shortcomings of the Mega CD. Technically, the 32X was somewhat similar to their forthcoming Saturn console, but was designed to allow the massive Mega Drive market to jump on the 32-bit bandwagon early, rather than jumping ship before the Saturn's arrival. But like the Mega CD, third-party development was lacking, even more so due to the Saturn's release in Japan at around the same time. The 32X would sell some 665,000 units by the end of 1994, and would be discontinued in 1996 with a weak library of just 40 titles. 94 would also see the release of the Sega Multimega, or CDX in North America, which incorporated the Mega Drive and Mega CD into one small package. But oddly, it retailed at $399 in the US, roughly $100 more than an individual Genesis and Sega CD. And what's more, it doesn't work with the 32X due to overheating and even electrical shock issues. Whilst Sega were faffing around with hardware, Nintendo were busy promoting and squeezing as much out of their 16-bit machine as possible. Titles like Donkey Kong Country, arriving in November 1994, developed by Rare, really demonstrated the system's abilities with pre-rendered 3D sprites. This was platforming on a whole new level, and although the Mega Drive would demonstrate it could do just as well with games like Toy Story the following year, the 16-bit scales were now almost 50-50 between Sega and its arch-rival. The incorporation of Sega's Virtua processor into Virtua Racing was also pretty groundbreaking, and even though it retailed for $100 in America and £70 in the UK, it was a pretty awe-inspiring game on the increasingly dated hardware. Something Nintendo had cottoned onto years ago with their FX and FX2 chips built into various cartridge games. February 1994 also brought around Sonic 3, regarded as the last good Sonic game by some, and for me, heralding the decline of the Mega Drive, despite a few last hurrahs. 
Even the Doom craze failed to escape the Mega Drive makeover, with copycats like Zero Tolerance and Bloodshot popping up to rival the cut-down Doom incarnation on the Super NES. The Super Nintendo would outsell the Mega Drive in most regions from 1995 through to 1997, with the Mega Drive officially discontinued worldwide in 1997. Although continuing to be sold as the Genesis 3 via Majesco in North America up until the end of the decade. The Super Nintendo hung on a little longer, selling 49 million consoles worldwide, while the Mega Drive still stands at almost 40 million, a pretty impressive figure in itself. The Sega Saturn released in the West in 1995 became Sega's main focus, and although successful in Japan, fell prey to the new player entering the market, the one both Sega and Nintendo had declined to work with, Sony. But that is a story for another day. Now, one thing the Mega Drive touched before most of these other consoles was online gaming. I briefly mentioned the Japanese MegaNet, which would also appear in Brazil in 1995, but North America also witnessed its own Sega channel, launching in December 1994 and offering downloadable games amongst news and cheat codes. It lasted until July 1998 and was quite pricey, but was a clear forerunner for many services we take for granted nowadays. At its peak, the channel had some 250,000 subscribers, which isn't too shabby at all for an online service in the mid-90s. The Genesis Nomad was released in October 1995 for North America, and allowed portable Genesis Entertainment. It had a solid library of games, obviously, and could be plugged into a television set, but Sega had overreached themselves and just couldn't support the Saturn, CDX, Sega CD, 32X, Genesis, Game Gear, and another handheld at the same time, and many of these products were frowned upon by Sega of Japan, who preferred to concentrate on their main product. Most were quickly dissipated to make way for the Saturn. <laughs> However, just like the Master System, this was far from the end for the Mega Drive. Numerous, possibly countless iterations of the hardware would be and are continued to be released to present day, from 6-in-1 boxes to Tech Toys Brazilian efforts, which like the Master System was well received in the area. A port of Duke Nukem 3D landed on Brazil's shores in 1998, offering a reasonable first-person experience, especially for 10-year-old hardware, and Tectoy even released the Mega Drive Guitar Idol in 2009. In your face, PlayStation owners. Função Idol Power na alavanca. E mais 87 jogos para você. Mega Drive 4 é da Tectoy. This iteration also features some Electronic Arts mobile ports, such as The Sims 2 and Sims City. There were even further cartridge releases in the West, with 2006 heralding Beggar Prince by Super Fighter Team, a conversion of the 1996 Chinese original. Super Fighter Team also released Legend of Wukong and Star Odyssey with Watermelon Software bringing Pierre Solar and the Great Architects to the table in December 2010. In 2009, some console on a chip variants were brought out by companies such as At Games, with their Firecore able to play original Genesis cartridges. There's also the countless Mega Drive game compilations for modern hardware, courtesy of Sega as the game churning, both good and bad factory they have recently become. Just last week, Tectoy actually announced a limited edition run of actual Mega Drives, featuring an additional SD slot and 22 bundled games. It appears this well-loved machine just refuses to die. The Mega Drive, Genesis, whatever you want to call it, is considered one of the best and most inspiring consoles ever produced. Its hardware and the games which ran on it stimulated a plethora of developers who would go on to do great things for rival machines and future hardware right up to this very day. And the console war between the Super Nintendo is one of the most fondly remembered of all time. And it's these playground debates and the experiences we had with these machines which ensure they continue to be discussed to this very day.
Thank you for watching my video on the Sega Mega Drive or Genesis. There's some more videos you can click below, you can subscribe, give it a thumbs up, share it, or if you want to keep the channel going, even contribute to my Patreon channel. There's some rewards you can receive if you want to do that. In any case, thank you very much for watching, and as always, have a very good night.